Uh, everyone, so my name is Chun Lin Xu. Uh, so together with my colleague, uh, Professor uh, Tina Ni Pele, and we have been uh, organizing this in practice. And really big thanks to Pedro and Janusz and also Karen uh, uh, and Natasha and for your support uh, behind this. And a special thanks to the junior group, and uh, uh, Julian uh, Selinger. And you, you have been contributing quite much to identify the research presentation uh, uh, speakers. Um, so some practical information before I introduce the first speaker. Uh, you need to be really careful with your uh, microphone. Keep it in, uh, mute. And uh, you can put questions uh, through the chat. Um, and uh, now we can start with our first uh, lecture, pl plenary lecture. Uh, given by um, Tatiana, Professor Tatiana Butova. Uh, she is an expert in polymer chemical physics, in particular uh, in polymer solutions, gels and aerogels with a focus on biomass-based polymers, and also in polymer composites with natural fibers. Uh, she defended her PhD in the Institute for Macromolecule Compounds of Russian Academic Sciences and got ha uh, habilitation in France. Tatiana holds a research director position in the Center for Materials Forming of Mines, Paris Tech, France. And she's a leader of a bio-based polymers composites group. She is one of the editors of the Carbohydrate Polymers Journal. And in 2020, she was awarded as a uh, silver medal by CNRS for the outstanding research related to bio aerogels. So uh, without no deal, I give the microphone to Professor uh, uh, Tatiana mm -hmm. Butova. Uh, please go ahead and kick off this uh, webinar. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, you are muted, uh, Tatiana. Sorry. Hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, where, wherever you are. Uh, I'm very happy and I'm honored. To, to, to start this webinar, I would like to thank my colleagues who, who have invited me. Um, and uh, I will share with you a story uh, about uh, what is called bioaerogels. So I'm starting my slides. So bioaerogels, new materials that were born in the 21st century. Um, I would like to say that I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that I was present at, at the birth of these materials. I don't know, I, I, I'm either I'm a, a mother or, or a doctor who, who, who helped the, the, the birth of these, uh, of these materials. So I will tell you, I will you tell you the story. These materials are still in their childhood. So let's have a look how, how it happened and uh, what is the character of, of, this, uh, of this baby. I will first, uh, with one slide, uh, introduce my, my research center where, where I'm working, because for those who don't know, this mean paritech may, may sound a bit, um, a bit uh, strange or not, uh, not uh, easy to understand. So it is an engineering school uh, School of Mines of Paris. Uh, it is one of the oldest and presti most prestigious universities, engineering schools in, in France, which was founded a long time ago before the French Revolution. So there are 18 research centers in, uh, in Nîmes Paris Tech. The headquarters are in Paris, but there are five research centers that are in Sofia Antipolis. And the research center where I'm working, it is there in the southern part of France. So this being said, let's move to, to aerogels. I'm dividing my, uh, my talk into, two, into four parts. I will first introduce aerogels, what, what they are and what are the main applications. Then we will see how the bioaerogels were born, some examples of bioaerogels properties and potential applications. And then I will speak about problems and, and prospects because nothing is perfect in life. And even bioaerogels, they have their, their, their problems. Um, so aerogels, uh, let's first look at the definition. What are aerogels? Aerogels are dry networks. They are not a gel where solvent is removed from the gel. They have low density, 
below 0.2 uh, gram per cubic centimeters. And what is very important is that they have very small pore size. They are below one micron or even most uh, often they are below uh, 100 nanometers. And this is what is making very high specific surface area of these aerogels. So specific surface area is the total surface uh, area of all the, all the all the pores inside these aerogels. And it can go up to more than 100 or several hundred square meters per gram. Uh, what is also important in terms of terminology uh, is, is the characteristics of the pores. So you should know that, that uh, what is called micropores is uh, the pores with the diameter below two nanometers. Mesopores are pores with diameter from two to 50 nanometers. And all the rest, the largest pores, called macropores, they have the diameter higher than 50 nanometers. So there is some, I would say, some confusions in literature. Sometimes people are calling micropores the pores that have the, the size of microns. This is not correct. Continuing with definitions, uh, EUPAC uh, uh, Gold Book uh, de defines uh, aerogel as following. It is a gel comprised of micropores. So micropores, you see here, it is below two nanometers. A micropore solid in which the dispersed phase is a gas. Uh, so with examples such as micropores silica, micropores glass, and xylites. This is causing a problem because uh, it is excluding a lot of aerogels that scientists developed since long time. For example, the classical uh, aerogel, which is based on silica, on CO2, is not fitting this terminology. So I would say that UPAC should change the terminology for aerogels to, to be really well represented. And this is what you see the images here, the examples of silica aerogels or polysaccharide-based aerogels in different shapes and forms, and the size of pores. Pay attention on the, uh, uh, on the scale of scanning electron microscopy. Uh, so this is 100 nanometers. So you see that the size of the pores is below or, or around uh, this value. How aerogels are made? So you start with a gel uh, and there is a drying procedure which removes the solvent. The problem is that during drying, there is a capillary pressure that is developed and capillary pressure depends on the surface tension between the liquid and the evaporating gas. Uh, the angle of contact between the liquid and the matter of the network and the pore radius. So if we look uh, more carefully at the phase diagram of, of any matter, which is uh, pressure against uh, temperature, uh, the, the drying that allows keeping pores open uh, and preserving the gel porosity uh, is drying in supercritical conditions. It means that the liquid, let's say a liquid in the pores in the gel is going through the supercritical state around here, passing by the critical point and then becoming a vapor and then evaporating. So just as a reminder, there can be an evaporative drying from liquid to vapor directly, or can be freeze drying from liquid, which is sublimated when it is in the solid state and then, uh, and then sublimated. So in supercritical conditions, the diffusivity of this, of the, the matter in this state is comparable to, glass, to, to gases. Uh, the density is between the gas and the liquid. And uh, in supercritical state, the matter has very high salvation power. And there is no meniscus uh, which is formed in, in this state because there is no liquid and no gas. And this is what is making capillary pressure theoretically zero. And this is what is attractive uh, for making aerogels. So in terms of the preservation of the structure, we can say uh, that uh, drying in supercritical conditions makes making aerogels 
is preserving the, the structure of the gel. When you are making freeze drying or lyophilization, usually it is water that is frozen in the pores of your gel. And then, okay, we can call it cryogel. We discussed, but for simplicity, we call it cryogel. Then the structure is not really well preserved because it is then the replica, the structure is the replica of ice crystals that, that are growing inside your, your, your gel. And uh, with ambient pressure or vacuum drying, let's call these materials xerogels, practically the structure is not preserved because there is a, a, all the collapse of, of the gel due to the development of, of the uh, capillary pressure. So the structure and the formation of the network is determining the materials properties. So this is an example uh, of, a, okay, here it is a case of a starch cryogel, which was obtained with freeze drying. So have a look at the uh, scale uh, in this scanning electron microscope. It is 20 microns. So the size of the pores are really the replicas of ice crystals that were growing inside and that was sublimated. In this and in the case of supercritical drying, uh, where if you remember now, uh, there is no meniscus that is formed and uh, the structure of the gel is preserved, the, the situation is very different. The, the, the scale is 100 nanometers and the pore size is much, much lower. So in the case of freeze drying, the specific surface area will be very low. And in the case of supercritical drying, the uh, specific surface area will be high. So as, just as a reminder, not all porous materials are aerogels. For example, there are foams like polyurethane foam uh, or, or other types of foams or sponges. They are, they are not aerogels. Uh, and here is an example why CO2 is usually used to do supercritical drying because it has rather mild conditions critical temperature around 30 degrees and critical pressure around seven uh, megapascal, which gives the density of, of the matter in supercritical state around 0 0.5. Many other liquids, including water, ethanol, uh, they, they have much higher temperature. So you cannot use them, for example, to make bioaerogels from polysaccharides. They, they, will, be, they will be destroyed. How, how aerogels in general were evolving in history? The first aerogels, they, they were synthesized by American scientists in the 30s. Uh, his name is Samuel Kistler. And they were made from so-called water glass, which is sodium, sodium uh, silicate. Uh, here is, you see the reaction, uh, very simple. Uh, but th th there was a drawback that there is a salt that was formed and which needs to be eliminated by dialysis. And then as uh, sodium silicate is dissolved in water, then to do drying in supercritical conditions, uh, water has to be exchanged to another fluid which is miscible with CO2. Water is not miscible with CO2. Then for a long time, this was almost forgotten. And then in the 70s, there was a new procedure that was invented, and it was so-called TEOS, tetraethyl orthosilicate, uh, that was used to make silica aerogels. It was dissolved in ethanol. So it simplified a lot the procedure. There was no need in solvent exchange, can be dried directly uh, with supercritical CO2. And then in our other inorganic aerogels started to be developed. In the 80s and 90s, synthetic polymer aerogels uh, were, uh, were synthesized for the first time. The first ones were based on resorcinol formaldehyde and other uh, synthetic polymers. And then at the beginning of the 21st century, it was found how to make uh, silica aerogels avoiding supercritical drying. And this was really a, a significant uh, breakthrough because uh, uh, even if supercritical drying is, is an industrial process and, and used in industry, for example, for extractions of spices or cleaning or uh, any other procedure, uh, avoiding uh, high pressure technology is, is making processing much easier. 
So the, the classical aerogels, silica aerogels or, or synthetic polymer aerogels are synthesized in the following way. You start with the solution or colloidal suspension of the precursor, whatever it is, small molecules. There is a chemical reaction uh, that, that, that um, uh, sort of a polymerization that increases the size from the small molecules to the soil, then soil gel transition induced by Catalyte catalysis or whatever in the catalyzer, and then the gel is formed, and then uh, the, the, the drying is performed to remove the solvent, usually with supercritical CO2. Um, silica aerogels, they are making, for example, the, in the, the, the small precursors, making siloxane bridges. So you can use different type of alkoxides uh, with, with the tails or the, the tetra methyl or oxysilane and, and, and so on. So you see the examples here, or poly epoxy disiloxane prepolymerized, uh, whatever, to, to make the, the structure of um, aerogels uh, better or more, more, more advanced. Metal oxide based. The aerogels are sim have similar principle of synthesis to silica based aerogels or synthetic polymer uh, aerogels with classical examples the resorcinol formaldehyde aerogel or, or melamine formaldehyde uh, aerogels. They are all starting with, uh, with small molecules with here for polycondensation reaction, growing, making a gel, and then drying in supercritical uh, state. So in, in all cases, the precursor is, is, is a monomer, small uh, molecules. So these are all these aerogels, they have low density, very small pore size, high specific surface area can be up to several thousand square meter per gram. And uh, uh, the applications of, of these classical aerogels, one of the uh, most, uh, okay, for the time being, attractive applications, they are thermal in insulation, it is thermal insulation and thermal super insulation. Uh, also carbons, when you pyrolyze, for example, uh, polymer ions in batteries and fuel cell membranes as catalysts and catalyst supports for adsorption, absorption or separation. And here is the scheme of the current applications. Okay, they are not really applications at the pilot scale applications of, uh, of aerogels. So they are, they are mainly uh, in oil and gas sector and the other industrial sectors and mainly in uh, thermal insulation uh, area. So the, there, are, there are two uh, American companies that are leaders in this field. They are making so-called blankets of silica aerogels or particles of silica aerogels. A Chinese company that is making boards of silica aerogels and French company also making particles of aerogels. And there was um, an interesting application of uh, silica aerogels that was sent in space uh, to collect uh, the dust uh, of the stars, star dust uh, collector. How it works, uh, thermal insulation of aerogels and thermal super insulation. What it is super insulation? So this is important because then we will see how bio aerogels can, can be used in this case or cannot be used in this case. So for porous materials, uh, the, in the first approximation, we can say that thermal conductivity of a porous material is a additive sum of the conduction of the solid, of the skeleton, of the gas and of the radiation. So the, the conductivity of the solid skeleton, uh, if we want to decrease the thermal uh, conductivity, we need a material with as low density as possible. If we want to decrease total thermal conductivity, how to decrease the conduction of the gas phase? For example, if there is air in, in the pores of our porous material, and it is possible to have the conductivity of the gas in the pores, which is lower than the conductivity of, let's say, of the surrounding air. This is called Knudsen effect. And this happens when the size of the pore of our material is lower than the mean free path of, let's say, air molecule. And the mean free path of air molecule is around 70 nanometers. So if you make a very lightweight material with pore size below 70 nanometers, 
and radiation is usually small uh, in optically thick uh, materials, you may have a chance to have very low thermal conductivity. So thermal conductivity as a function of density is, is represented schematically as a U-shaped curve. And everybody is looking for, for the minimum at this paper uh, point, which is a compromise become the, between having low density and, uh, and low pore sizes. And this is an example of silica aerogels. So have a look again at uh, uh, the, the scale uh, of this scanning electron microscope, 100 nanometers. So the pores are very, very small. They are really that's mesoporous material with low density. And this makes the thermal conductivity much lower, twice lower than the conductivity of the air. It makes, it, it looks a bit like, 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 like a mysterious material that, that do the ambient pressure and ambient condition. You, you have a solid, a porous solid with a conductivity which is lower than the conductivity of the surrounding air. But, but this is possible. So why to bother about so low thermal conductivity? Uh, because if, if you want to have a, a performance is insulation of, of your walls, for example, and you cannot put the insulation outside, you have to put insulation uh, inside. And probably you don't want to reduce a lot the, the living space of your, of your apartment. So for example, for conventional insulating, reaching a certain value, which is called the performance of the insulating material, uh, with the thermal conductivity around 0 0.035 uh, watt per meter per Kelvin, the thickness to reach the, the, this value, uh, let's say four, will be 14 centimeters. But if you use silica aerogels, you divide this thickness by twice. There are also vacuum insulation panels, okay, with vacuum inside, which makes the matter, the, the overall construction with very low conductivity. But vacuum insulation panels have the problem that, that if there is a small crack inside, you lose them, and then you lose the, 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 all the performance in, in the conductivity. So with the history of, of classical aerogels, silica aerogels and synthetic polymer aerogels, then the breakthrough in the ambient pressure drying of silica aerogels, what next to do? To improve the mechanical properties. Okay, there are problems with silica aerogels, uh, dusting, which means releasing small particles, aging. Uh, so then there was, uh, there is a need to, to find a way to, to dry synthetic polymer aerogels in ambient pressure to decrease the price and so on. So what, what, what is the next? What is the next breakthrough? And the next breakthrough is to make bio aerogels. And this was done at the beginning of the 21st century. How it happened? You are now working all or studying uh, polysaccharides. You know that, that cellulose, starch, marine polysaccharides, they are abundant and renewable. They are human friendly, which means that we are eating, we are using them every day in pharma, in textiles, in food, in feed, in cosmetics, and so on. What, what was the situation with the uh, bioaerogels? At that time, they were not called bioaerogels around the beginning of the 21st century. There were two, three forgotten articles and they were not called bioaerogels. Few researchers dried uh, polysaccharide-based aerogels with supercritical drying, but this did not go further. So scientifically, this topic is very attractive, uh, especially in the view of making new biomaterials. And obviously, the hot topic, uh, the hot, uh, okay, hot thermal insulation, uh, or better to say, low <laughs> with, with the low thermal conductivity, which is a hot topic. So at that time, the bioaerogels were started uh, to be made from polysaccharides. Now bioaerogels are made from proteins and, and, and other biomass-based matter. So you may ask how it happened. As I said, okay, I'm either a doctor or a mother, or I don't know, sister of, of, of these bioaerogels. So it ha happened uh, thanks to, to very nice collaboration with our, our neighbor research centers. 
So we had in total the expertise in synthetic polymer gels and solutions in cellulose, in cellulose dissolution. And uh, our neighbors, they, they were experts in, in organic and synthetic polymer uh, aerogels. And mixing all this gave a synergy, and this is how bioaerogels were born. So it was a very fruitful collaboration between our two research centers. That was the first European uh, project, uh, which was called Aerocell, uh, which explored the few applications of aerogels based on cellulose. Uh, Austrian company Lenzing uh, uh, launched a, a patent uh, uh, for cellulose aerogels that were based on uh, cellulose dissolved in, in MMO. Uh, and we did the aerogels uh, based on cellulose dissolved in sodium hydroxide. And Fraunhofer uh, in Gölm did the aerogels based uh, on uh, carbamate, cellulose carbamate. Uh, and we, we uh, submitted in the Lopsolo in the year to, to in the year 2004. So you may ask why to bother making polysaccharide-based aerogels if the other materials are so, so nice and, and, and wonderful. There are reasons. In fact, inorganic, uh, in particular silica-based aerogels, for the time being, still are too expensive for mass applications. And it is the initial matter that is expensive because to make good aerogels, you need very clean CO2, uh, even if it is not supercritically dried. And you, you need to improve the mechanical properties of uh, uh, silica uh, aerogels uh, because they are, they are very, very fragile. And hydrophobization is needed uh, to uh, prevent uh, their aging. And synthetic polymer aerogels in general, they are cheap as a starting material. They can compete with silica aerogels properties. They have much better mechanical properties based on polymers, but the synthesis, uh, as you can imagine, there is also no formaldehyde or polyurethane aerogels. It's not always uh, very nice. And still it needs a supercritical drying. Bioaerogels, in particular, polysaccharide-based aerogels, they are based on renewable polymers. They are not expensive. There is no toxic compound involved. So the question is, can bioaerogels compete with these old or classical uh, aerogels? Let's have a look at this. How bioaerogels are synthesized? So you remember the, the scheme of the synthesis of classical bioaerogels. And in fact, you don't need the, the step uh, because uh, aerogels are made, bioaerogels are made from polymers that, that are already made by nature, that there is no chemical reaction of polymerization. So you start with a biopolymer solution, you gel it or not, is even possible to not, not to use gelation. You have a, a wet network with a, a liquid inside the pores which is miscible with CO2, and then you can make drying and obtain bioaerogel. So there is no need in polymerization, maybe no need in gelation. There is a need in solvent exchange. And what has to be kept in mind that aerogel precursor, this wet network is not in a way a gel anymore because the, sol the, the liquid which is inside the pores of this net network is, is not a solvent anymore. So it is a coagulated polymer. So we need to know well the properties of the starting polymer because this will, this will uh, define the, the properties and gelation or not gelation of the whole, uh, the whole processing uh, story of making bioaerogels. Now I would like to, that's mainly message to, to the students if they are, they are listening. So when somebody is saying, I'm working on cellulose aerogels, obviously there are exceptions. I'm working on cellulose aerogels. So please remember what I'm saying now, my scheme, and ask, are you making cellulose aerogel via dissolution? If yes, in what solvent? In what non-solvent? And are you drying with supercritical CO2? because you may gel cellulose solution or you may not gel cellulose solution. That will make different morphologies of the network and different morphologies 
of your bio-aerogel. And this is an example of the importance, again, of the supercritical drying. This is the, the, the bio-aerogel with a very fine network. And this is cellulose, which was freeze-dried. And you see the size of the pores of several, is, of several microns. Or maybe for cellulose or chitin, you are starting with nanocellulose or nanochitin. That's another story. So this is not a solution, it is a suspension. In this case, it is, for example, uh, if it is cellulose nanofibers or cellulose nanocrystals, or maybe bacterial cellulose, they are dispersed in water, then water has to be replaced by a fluid which is miscible with CO2, then you will do supercritical drying and obtain by a regel. And this is again an example of importance of, of the drying step. Uh, aerogel based on nanocellulose. Have a look at the scale, 0 0.5 microns, a very tiny pores, and the, the uh, nanofibrillated uh, cryogel made by freeze drying. You see the scale is 50 microns and the pores are of several tens or in, of several microns, which makes a lot, huge difference in, in the properties. To be fully honest with you, I would say that it is possible to make aerogels with freeze drying, which means using freeze drying and obtaining high specific surface area and low uh, size small pores. But there, there, are, there are very special cases that, that has, to be, has to be considered, has to be used. Two examples of bioaerogel properties, how to do the shaping, how to put them in different shapes. In fact, that, that's easy. For gelling solutions like alginate or pectin or carrageenan, you, you, you gel your solution in, in the shape you want, and then aerogel will keep this, the shape of, of, of the gel. It's possible to also make beads. So these are the examples of cellulose aerogel, pectin aerogel, and starch aerogel. It is possible also to make beads, aerogel beads. Uh, in fact, uh, as soon as you manage to make uh, microgel or, or gel particle beads, then you, you apply the procedure of solvent exchange and drying, and, and then you, you get uh, by aerogel beads. So you can use either lab scale method, simply dropping your solution either or in gelling bath or in coagulating bath, or you can use uh, procedures that can, can uh, that are used to, for upscaling, like jet cutting, for example, or atomi atomization or prilling, and then you obtain uh, bioaerogels of different sizes, a uh, few millimeters, uh, submillimeter size. But you see that the the, the structure, the, the morphology, and specific surface area is still is still very high. The, the point is that when you are making gel beads, you need to avoid evaporated drying. So if you manage to do it, then you can, let's say, rather easily obtain bioaerogel particles. You can also use an uh, emulsion approach uh, and, and obtain bioaerogels of, of very small size, of the size of uh, from few microns to few tens of microns. This is an example of cellulose uh, aerogel particles, and this is an example of alginate aerogel particles. So you see a few, few tens, around 10, uh, 10 uh, uh, microns, uh, but uh, the, the morphology inside is the same and uh, as for large uh, samples of uh, bioaerogels with high specific surface area. So shaping does not change the intrinsic properties. So the mechanical properties of bioaerogels uh, are, are very good. They are, they are uh, strong materials. This is a stress-strain curve, uh, which shows that you can compress, and these are the, the photos, you can, can compress uh, bioaerogel a lot, and it will be compressed without breaking. And the young modulus of bioaerogels are higher than the young modulus of silica aerogels. This is the case for pectin aerogels, this we call in the, in the lab aeropectin and aerocellulose, so, so cellulose aerogels and pectin aerogels. And now what about thermal conductivity? You remember the hot topic huh, for, for thermal insulation. So everybody wants to get this minimum on the curve, 
And we worked a lot on uh, uh, cellulose aerogels. Uh, this is the graph showing the thermal conductivity as a function of, of uh, aerogel density. And this is the conductivity of the air in blue. And whatever we did, a lot of efforts. We were cross-linking cellulose, not cross-linking cellulose. And we were not able to make super insulating material, which means to have conductivity values below that of the air. And if you look at the scanning electron microscopy uh, images, you see that the pore sizes is not really in the mesopores area. So we are the, the input of Knudsen effect is, is rather low. Uh, the pore size, uh, the pore walls are rather thick. Uh, I don't know why cellulose is doing this. It is not possible to obtain cellulose uh, aerogels uh, with super insulating properties. Maybe somebody from of you will be challenged by this task and will make it. So then, then you, will, you will publish in a, a good article. So what to do? We were in the middle of the, the project, so we promised to, to make bioaerogels with thermal super insulating properties, and we were not able to, to do it. So we said, okay, I told to myself, okay, we stop, we stop, we stop and think what to do next. We knew that we need a very fine network structure with very small pores. At that time, okay, it was uh, six, uh, seven years ago, I looked in literature and what is known, not much at the time, about polysaccharide-based aerogels. And I suggested to my PhD student to test pectin to make aerogels, not cellulose. There were a few publications about pectin aerogels at that time, but not many. Well, at that time, it was, it was a, uh, okay, it was a, challenge. It was a combination of literature analysis and intuition, very, very high risk of failure. So we said, okay, we, we tried. We tried and we managed. And we managed to obtain the first thermal super insulating pectin aerogel. So you see the conductivity as a function of density and we have the values that are below that of, of the air, the very fine structure of pectin aerogels. And the same year, Probably they were thinking in the same way. I don't know if they had also the, the projects or the industry involved, but the Japanese team with Professor Saito and Professor Isagai got also thermal super insulating nanofibrillated cellulose aerogels. Again, conductivity as a function of density with values that are below that of the air. And we did it the same year. Then we continued our research on, on pectin aerogels and we obtained what is the classically known for other aerogels, the U-curve. See, conductivity is a function of density, a very, very nice uh, structure. Also, it is possible to do the pyrolysis to, to burn aerogels. We did it on cellulose aerogels. We obtained carbon, uh, carbon aerogels of low density, uh, with rather high volume of the mesopores, with interesting diameter of, uh, of, of the pores, and uh, uh, very good discharge properties. So we were able to, to have the volume capacity as compared with the reference materials. It was increased by 10, 15%, and this is not, uh, this is not negligible. Now, bioaerogels, in particular polysaccharide-based aerogels, they are, okay, they are renewable, non-toxic compounds are used in the preparation. The most toxic is ethanol, which is, which is nothing. So we eat polysaccharides every day uh, and we use them in biomedical applications. So the next step is to use bioaerogels for, as, as delivery matrices, for example, or for scaffolds, or for different types of biomedical applications. So then here shape becomes important together with internal structure. Is it possible to make complex shapes of, of bioaerogels? Is it possible to incorporate some active compounds inside? Uh, and there, there are, as a consequence, many advantages of using bioaerogels for biomedical applications. They are lightweight, they're easy to transport, no bacterial growth because they are not uh, with any with water inside. Preser preserved shaped shape because they are dry, 
large variety of making cellular composite materials with interpenetrated network, control porosity, and, and different release properties. And you can incorporate, depending on which matter you are working with, you can incorporate your active substances either in biopolymer solution or by impregnation in aerogel precursor or during drying. It depends on hydrophilic, hydrophobic properties of your drug. And then your drug will be released. And then there are numerous approaches that are known for controlled release that should be tested for by aerogel. So this area is, is really un under development. So what we are doing now, for example, is we are trying to do 3D printed aerogels for wound dressing applications. So it is a dream, it is an ongoing project. I hope we will manage. So for example, we dissolve chitosan, we make printed chitosan aerogel, we incorporate active substances, and then we, uh, we hope to have the aerogel that will fit the wound and we, we are targeting the, the chronic wounds that are difficult to, to cure, like diabetic foot wounds or burns or ulcers and, and so on. And then if the, this aerogel contains some active sub, uh, compounds that, are, that can cure the wound, then these compounds will be released in time. And we have some promising results. So this is, for example, here a printed chitosan gel and this is the, the it, it, it was dried with supercritical CO2, and this is the printed chitosan aerogel. Still, there is a lot, a lot to discover and to adapt for biomedical applications. I'm finishing my, my, my talk with, with problems and, and prospects. So bio aerogel, they are in their infancy stage, stage uh, they, are, they are about 15 years old. 15 is not infancy, but uh, okay, for bio aerogel, they are really, really very young. Yeah, they are not yet teenagers. And most of them are made by, by trials and errors. And the majority of publications, they are, they are testing formulations, what will happen if we do this and that. So modeling is, is very strongly missing. And there are a lot of questions to answer, uh, fundamental and, and uh, applied questions. So how network structure is built? There are two mechanisms, gelation or phase separation. What are correlations between the type of the biopolymer, structure formation and aerogel properties? As I mentioned, modeling is non-existent. Absolutely nothing is known. How, how to make thermal super insulating bio aerogels? There, there is nothing, or so on. How to avoid supercritical drying, keeping the same properties? This is, this is a big question, and that, that's very important. And, and it's a fundamental question, and because you know, if you dry polysaccharide gel in ambient conditions, uh, you, will not, uh, you will not obtain a porous material. Some applications, they need hydrophobicity. So how to avoid harsh chemistry uh, to, 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 to make hydrophobic uh, bioaerogels, how to control aging, uh, various applications, new applications in life science, pharma, cosmetics, medicine. Characterization of bioaerogels has a lot of problems. For example, okay, I don't have time, but there is no method to measure pore size distribution, which is very important. So bioaerogels still have several weaknesses. It is, uh, th there are very different applications that are practically not overlapping. If you speak with people who are working on thermal insulation area and, and, and in, in polysaccharides, they are speaking different languages, even if using English at the same time, they don't understand each other. Or people who are doing catalyst and, and uh, polysaccharides, uh, okay, that's coming now, but, but up to now, recently, they, they were not understanding each other. But this is making the opportunity also. That, so this multidisciplinarity, will create and must create synergy and, and discoveries. And this sense, I'm always citing Winston Churchill who said that a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity and optimist say, sees the opportunity in every difficulty. So I wish you to see opportunity in every difficulty.
And with this, I would like to finish my talk and thank everybody who, who, who was working with me, the, the, the students and, and colleagues and, and funding agencies. And thank you for your attention. And I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you.